Welcome back to Science vs. Conspiracy Over Coffee. Unless you've been living in a cave, you're probably aware that today is the third anniversary of COVID-19 being declared a pandemic. Yeah, but if you've been living in a cave with some bats, you're probably the one who started the pandemic. Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) But honestly, all joking aside, yes, today is the anniversary and it's actually been deemed a day of national observance in Canada, I'm not sure about the states, for all of those who have died and anyone who really suffered a significant impact from COVID, which I think is all of us. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I have a few U.S. statistics because a lot of our listeners are in the States and more than one million people in the States have died from COVID. And still to this day, 500 people a day are dying from the disease. But in the coming month, the U.S. is no longer going to be deeming it an emergency designation for testing, vaccines and medication if you get ill. Interesting. Yeah. But you know, still 6% of the US reports having long COVID symptoms, still. Hmm. So, I mean, never mind the financial impact, et cetera, there's no question about the severity of the way COVID-19 changed the world. But what there is still questions about is how it got started. Exactly. Brew some coffee, pull up a chair and open your mind. This week on the third anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, we will be discussing the origins of COVID-19 over coffee. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And before we jump into COVID-19, we have to talk about our coffee. Yeah. I mean, after all, this is science versus conspiracy over coffee. So what were you drinking today? Well, you know, again, not an ad, not sponsored, but today I'm having Starbucks. And I'll tell you one thing that I love right now is the um, brown sugar oat and then either the iced or the hot. And for the hot, it's an Americano. And oh man, I love that drink. I love the brown sugar. It's just the right amount of sweetness, but not too sweet. Really tasty coffee. It's made with their blonde espresso. Mm -hmm. Super yummy. So if you haven't tried it yet, go get it. Yeah, and I stuck with my classic Pike. Black. Black. Black Pike Black is the Black is the sky on a moonless night. All right. All right. So let's let's uh, dive in here. So as as I said in the introduction, this week marks the third anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring a global pandemic on the then relatively unknown virus, the highly contagious SARS-CoV-2, and that became better known as COVID-19. So just for people who aren't aware of the difference, why it's called two different things, the SARS, it stands for uh, Severe Acute Respiratory um, Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then um, CoV is because it's the coronavirus, which is the type of virus. And then it's labeled too because there's other SARS, uh, there's other SARS coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. And then COVID-19 is actually the name that people have given to the, the illness so, I mean, if you're talking specifically about the, the virus itself, you got to talk about the SARS-CoV-2. And if you're talking about the illness, you should talk about COVID-19. But still, I mean, we, we mix and match just in like regular conversation. But right. just thought you might want to know. Yeah, thanks. So in the months leading up to March 11, 2020, there was widespread rumors that there was a breach in the Wuhan Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. These reports were quickly dismissed by officials, including Dr. Fauci, the de facto face of the pandemic in the United States. He claimed instead the virus originated from a bat sold in a wet market that just happened to operate in close proximity to the Wuhan Institute. In recent weeks, a report from the Office Inspector General of the 
the Department of Health and Human S uh, Services and supported by the FBI and the Department of Energy concluded that it's very likely that the virus did in fact originate from a breach from the Wuhan Institute. Not exactly, but I'll let you continue. The government seems determined to keep this fact a secret. If the allegations are found to be true, would this change the events of the last three years? Well, first of all, how are they determined to keep this supposed fact, air quotes for people uh, listening, um, we're not actually filming this on video today, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but if they're determined to keep this quote unquote fact a secret, then why is it all over the news that it was supposedly leaked from a lab? Well, that's the thing. They're trying to downplay that it was actually um, leaked from a lab. But it's all over. I get I get all these um, news uh, emails weekly mm -hmm. as part of my ongoing uh, lifelong learning and curiosity, and I've gotten several reports about it. Exactly, and they're they're the, these reports. Um, they're coming out, and yesterday the United States government voted unanimously to declassify all the COVID-19 documents. So again, how are they determined to keep this a secret? None of that suggests secrecy and cover-up to me. That suggests transparency and news dissemination. Right, but the key players, like Dr. Fauci, is denying that this is actually happening. So we have to go back and look at some of the key players and the timeline of these events. Okay. And we also have to look at actual health science mm -hmm. and the institutes that actually discuss um, infectious diseases mm -hmm. and the reports that they have made. Because there does seem to be a split in what the actual source of the virus was. Okay, so let, let's go back a little bit here and talk about the timeline and we'll throw in some of the key players as we go along. And you can jump in and shoot me down <laughs> <laughs> All as, right. as we go. Sounds good. <laughs> so from what I've been able to, to gather, and it, it goes back even further and there's a lot more, but... For the purposes of this podcast, let's go back to 2002. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so we'll go back to 2002 in China, November. Um, I'm not sure in the exact date, but sometime in November, uh, there was a SARS emer uh, a version of SARS emerged in China. Okay, that's not a big deal. We had SARS in Canada. Yeah, well, that's what I'm getting to here. Okay. So the SARS in this instant, in this outbreak uh, spread to more than 20 countries, including Canada. Yeah. Okay. By 2003, February of 2003, there was a massive outbreak in Toronto originating from a traveler from Hong Kong. Right. So over 8,000 people uh, were infected and... 774 of them died, according to the WHO. Okay. Okay. From the SARS in 03, in 02, 03. 03. Yeah, okay. and then it stopped by July. Okay. You want to say anything? No, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't argue any of that. That was fact. We lived mm -hmm. through it. We lived through it. We did. Yeah, I was in Toronto at the time, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I clearly remember that happening. Yeah. Um, so in the final days of the outbreak, it bounced between humans and animals in a wet market across China. Okay, now wait a minute. Are you talking about SARS from, from the 0203? Yes, so this is in 2004. Okay, so you're talking about there was a final well, days? Yeah, final days, a push for this before it died out. It hasn't died out. This... SARS, SARS is still around and can still happen. Oh, I, I know that, but the, the mutation or the, the strain that caused the O2 outbreak, O203 outbreak, 
has largely died out from from the HHS website. I have I have sources. <laughs> you have sources. I have sources. Yeah. Okay. Well, also, you might want to make sure to leave the science reading um, applicable. Mm-hmm science reading to me too because i understand science but go mm-hmm. ahead okay so this is where it kind of gets interesting i thought okay so putting all the science aside and everything and it's it's more about the containment and the spread and the the narrative that the governments around the world were were pushing at the time so they said that that there were smaller outbreaks in laboratories in Hong Kong, or sorry, in Taiwan and Singapore during 2004, or like the, they, they mentioned that in 2004 and they're talking about it from the 2002 outbreak. So when we talk about COVID-19 or the, the pandemic and it being impossible to have come from a laboratory, there, there was already stuff put in place. Like, there was already outbreaks in previous years related to um, uh, a respiratory illness escaping from the lab. So you're saying that SARS, the original mm-hmm. in 03, came from a lab? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> that's, not, that's not factually backed Doc- up. No, it it is. I I, I got it right here. It did not come from a lab. Yeah. It did not escape a lab. This is the third outbreak of SARS to have been traced to a laboratory. Small outbreaks also occurred in Taiwan and Singapore last year. This was back in 2004. The who may... uh, the, The who may call for containment policies for SARS to reduce the number of samples of viruses and the number of laboratories holding it, said Dr. Hall. Okay, so um, what you've shared with me Mm -hmm. is um, a 2004 Mm -hmm. opinion piece um, that does have a quote from Dr. Hall Mm -hmm. from the WHO, Um, but it doesn't say that it was a a leak it's there's still an index patient and they're trying to figure out how the incident occurred they can't find any single incident or accident that explains the case and this is 2004 Mm -hmm. so i mean this is really early days and so there's been much more uh research and Mm -hmm tracking and tracing since then so i would have to do a deeper dive to see if there's been anything brought forward since then but this is this is one tiny little opinion piece an opinion piece okay so that's done in 2004 about the 2002 three outbreak but it's starting to show this pattern of the plausibility of an outbreak being leaked from a laboratory. Also. But anything can show mm-hmm. a, a possible leak. I mean, you could have somebody say, oh, it was possibly a leak. And there's your evidence. It's not, it's not solid evidence at all. Mm-hmm. So in 2005, a, a group of researchers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology published research into the origins of the SARS coronavirus, finding that China's horseshoe bats are natural reservoirs of SARS-like coronaviruses. Correct. Correct. So one one thing that keeps coming up is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, right? No. No? <laughs> well, Maybe. 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 So, I mean, really, um, science has advanced even since SARS was Mm -hmm. first found. And so while they might have thought it was a a lab leak, quote unquote, initially, Mm -hmm. um, even as recently as 2020, there was uh, a paper published that shows that the most likely origin was 
um, cross contamination, like what's called zoonotic when it goes from what jumps from animal to human, mm -hmm. um, zoonotic transmission from civets, which are they're funny little nocturnal mammals. Um, and they're they're actually really cute if you see a picture of them. Um, I don't know. They're called palm civet, palm civets. Um, they kind of look like a mix between a raccoon and a lemur, but they're neither. <laughs> right. And um, so what seems likely is that these were animal handlers in the Guangzhou city mm -hmm. that were dealing with um, wild game food. And then it started jumping person to person from there. Okay. So, so animal to human. Animal to human. Civets, mm -hmm. meat, mm -hmm. jumping to human, super spreader, brought it. It looks like there was um, a medical professor from uh, Guangdong, um, the, the Guangdong province, mm -hmm. who went to Hong Kong to visit his relatives and thus then transmitted it to more and more people. And then it eventually was able to jump to all these other countries, 32 countries. So this was the, the 2002, 2003. Correct. 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 Okay. That's what it appears to be most, most likely. Mm. Because, you know, at the time, those civets would have been, you know, sold, eaten. Um, they can't. That's the problem with these zoonotic transmissions mm -hmm. is that these animals are, are gone. They're used. Right. Right. So it's, it's, there's still that one thing that's impossible literally impossible to, to trace back mm -hmm. um, because they're they're gone, they're eaten or used. So there's teams of researchers trying to sort all this stuff out, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And they're going, obviously, the research is being conducted in laboratories, mm -hmm. laboratories around the world. Mm -hmm. And especially in China at the, the Wuhan Institute. Okay. Okay. I follow you. All right. So just a little bit of a background on this lab. Okay. So it was created in 1956 as the Wuhan Microbiology Laboratory under the Chinese Academy of Science. And over the years, it jumped around from different agencies. But back in 2017, it returned to the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Okay. Okay. And now it has, it's been upgraded to um, a level four BSL. Oh, okay. Do you know what BSL? The bioscientific laboratory? Um, so it, it's at the highest level, level four containment and all that kind of stuff, right? Okie dokie. Okay. And to upgrade the laboratory, um, a huge amount of funding came from the French government and also uh, the Americans. Okay. Okay. So there's lots of research going on in Wuhan, lots of research into the origins of SARS and the coronavirus and other coronaviruses. Yeah, because there's actually seven that have really mm -hmm. hit humans. Right. And it's from all sorts of animals. Correct. Bats, rabbits, minks. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> excuse me. And in 2019, uh, cases of pneumonia um, associated with an unknown coronavirus were reported to health authorities in Wuhan. And that's where you get the the phrase "novel mm -hmm. coronavirus" because "novel" means new in this case. Right. So the institute checked it, um, checked its coronavirus collection, and found the new virus had 96% genetic similarities to RATG13, a virus researchers had discovered in horseshoe bats um, in southwest China. Okay. So genetic similarity mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's the same one, though, right? Because, you know, there's that statistic that we share so much of our own DNA mm -hmm. with. Uh, chimpanzees, but I am not a chimpanzee. Right. Oh, I, I yeah, I get that. Okay, so we have looked at the we we've looked at the laboratory, and we've looked at um, SARS from two thousand two, and some of the um, the research that's gone into it 
um, to kind of find out where it came from. And according to you, it came from these little... Well, the, the civets. The civets. In, it, for the 2002-2003. Mm-hmm. Um, but we haven't started talking about COVID-19 yet. Correct. Because we're all kind of, we're leading up. Yeah. Um, and you got to look at where the money is coming from, who funds. It has nothing to do with that. Oh, it does. But okay. Because in 2017, um, the, the Institute co-authored with the University of North Carolina um, about the coronavirus research in with horseshoe bats. Okay. Okay. Um, some of the research and the funding was coming from uh, from from the U.S. into the Wuhan lab. Well, okay. What does that have to do with anything, though? Okay. What I'm what I'm establishing here is this narrative that it came from. It had to have come from a uh, a, a bat from a wet market when. Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield, um, who was the former head of the CDC in the U.S., said that he was sidelined um, in the beginning of the pandemic um, and not being involved with um, excluded. He has been excluded from meetings as his views did not align with other scientists like Dr. Fauci. Okay. So you're la- you're you're well, laughing I'm, at me here. I'm smiling, folks, because um, and this just came it's out a lot news. of conspiracy talk that still doesn't have any actual implications on how it was um, first transmitted from animal to human. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just I'm just kind of letting you dig your hole here, <laughs> and then mind. I'll set you straight. <laughs> Because so far it's just like, oh, well, this guy's feelings were hurt because he didn't get to talk about it the way he wanted to talk about it. And like, oh, well, they're muzzled in China and they're not allowed to talk about it. Okay, but still. So Dr. Redfield, he was the head of the CDC, so he should have been involved in in these. Redfield. What did I say? No, Redfield. Yeah, Redfield. Outer Banks. Oh, (laughs) Yeah, so he should have been involved, one of the key players involved, but because his views didn't align with this narrative that they had, they were, that they were starting to create, um, he was excluded uh, from these meetings. It was three years ago. Lots has evolved since then. I know, but he he should have still been involved. Okay, Where coulda, the- woulda, shoulda. <laughs> we got science to talk about. Yeah. Okay, so then Dr. Fauci... He's been involved with the National Institute of Health for a very long time. Yep. And he had commented even on the 2003, he commented in 2004 about the 2002-2003 outbreak of of the SARS pen, um, SARS, yeah. SARS outbreak. And, okay, so Dr. Fauci claimed back in 2020 uh, when all this was starting to unravel that... That he had, as, as part of the the National Institute of Health, because they were also funding the Wuhan lab, that there was um, that that they weren't working on a gain of function research at the Wuhan lab into the coronavirus. But according to two academic peer-reviewed papers from 2015 and 2017 that I mentioned before with the University of North Carolina, uh, all it, those papers met the requirements that they were working on uh, gain-of-function research. Okay, can you explain what that means to people? So the gain of... Because I'm still not learning anything here. You're just learning. So gain-of-function is when uh, a virus is manipulated, mutated, and gains other functions that it wasn't originally designed for or that like originally found in nature. So gain of function, it's gaining, it's learning um, the ability to do something else. So in this case, what, I'm, what they're implying is that 
the coronavirus was animal to animal, but in the Wuhan lab, they were working on a way to weaponize it to go from animal oh, into human. Lord, no. No, that is not the mic drop that you think it is. Because, first of all, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the way science works. They grow things in the lab. Mm -hmm. They mutate it in the lab. They introduce different things to it in the lab. This is how disease are, diseases mm -hmm. are cured, um, how treatments are created, how medications are made. Because they have to mutate things and then introduce their uh, proposed treatments to eradicate things. I mean, that's how that's how you know a lot of the cancer treatments that everybody benefits from mm -hmm. have been created, right? So things are constantly being being altered in laboratories. Everything everything down to the um, the food we eat, you know. Mm -hmm vitamins we take everything's being altered in labs to determine how different variables are going to interact and react with it so that they can determine how it works so just because it may have been a quote-unquote gain of function it doesn't mean that they were weaponizing like that is such conspiracy talk that's not how science works people don't sit around a lab and go Ooh, I'm going to weaponize this. I worked on a laboratory study back in, oh my God, what year was it? Actually, it was 2004 mm -hmm. to make infant formula more digestible for babies who were missing a particular enzyme. And I had to actually go into the lab and work with the people behind the bench. And then I was taking this particular formula out to mothers who had these babies and we weren't weaponizing the baby formula. It was being altered in a lab, yeah, but it was to make it easier for them to digest. Gain a function? Okay, and there's, there's lots of different research going on that they're not weaponized. They don't weaponize everything. <laughs> I know. But so that, we that's why this is so conspiratorial, because it doesn't mean that that's what they were doing here either. Okay, but... After um, SARS happened mm -hmm. and MERS as well, mm -hmm. right? Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Like people, they have to. This is, this is the mandate of science is to evolve and protect humanity. So mm -hmm. of course they have to try and genetically alter or, or work with different viruses to see, you know, what can happen next and how can we treat it because they want to get ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. They want to have treatments for things, especially, you know, if you consider like a broad spectrum antibiotic that can treat so many different things that they just kind of throw it at you when you go into ER because the blood work hasn't come back yet. They don't know what you have. So they give you a, a broad spectrum antibiotic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably what some of this stuff was. Okay. So probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably. So the NIH, the National Institute of Health, awarded a contract to EcoHealth uh, in 2014 through 2021, uh, but really 2020. And there was an audit by the Office of the Inspector General uh, that just was released about this audit. And there was some irregular irregularities in the way the money was being used. Okay. Sure, still doesn't mean that COVID was weaponized. <laughs> people people suck with money all the time. Right, but this is... People are underhanded and dastardly. Um, $8 million. Still. $1.8 million um, to eight subrecipients, including three wa uh, Wahoo, <laughs> in <laughs> including Wuhan Institute of Virology. Okay, it was awarded money from the National Institute of Health. Okay. Headed by Dr. Fauci. Okay. Okay, so you have Dr. Fauci, NIH, funding work that's going into the Wuhan lab. Okay, but you guys have to understand that geneticists around the world have mm -hmm. been working in concert to try to cure cancer and other diseases. And 
So these types of large projects wherein, yes, the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, mm -hmm. is helping fund other laboratories. Are they only helping fund that one in Wuhan? No. They're helping fund laboratories around the world because the scientists work together to try to create some of these um, treatments. And so it's not as dastardly and underhanded as people might think. Except when a global pandemic spreads from Wuhan, China, where this Wuhan lab... But that is, that is, that's, that's just a proximity bias. I mean, the, the fact that the, the disease seems to have sprung from the same area where the lab is, it doesn't mean anything. But we already talked about in 2002-2003 that some minor SARS outbreaks were linked to possible lab breaches. It was not. It was. It said so. Yeah. Okay, so if there wasn't anything questionable going on, um, the Trump administration terminated the NIH's grant uh, into the coronaviruses, uh, transferring from bat to human. Optics, probably. Um, the New York-based NIH-funded EcoHealth um, has been subject to controversy and increased scrutiny due to its ties to the Wuhan Institute. It's because they were mismanaging money. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, okay, so the government cancels their funding. You know who picked up the funding? Who? The Gates Foundation. Okay, because Bill Gates is trying to save the world by, like, curing malaria and all these other things? He's trying to destroy the world. No! It doesn't make any sense why the U.S. is funding a laboratory in China I mean, there's all sorts of funding from the U.S. around the world. Like, there's mm -hmm. there's all sorts of bio labs overseas. You know, they're also helping with the biological threat reduction program uh, in Ukraine. Like, there's all sorts of stuff. So, I mean, these these links that um, some people are drawing mm -hmm. are unsubstantiated with evidence. Like, there's no there's no evidence just because they may have been funding a lab partially. Mm -hmm. in Wuhan, you know, they're also funding all sorts of other labs just because China happens to be, you know, a very um, questionable country with respect to human rights doesn't mean that they still want all their people to die. <laughs> and so they're trying to, to help um, global research into curing diseases. Okay, we'll, we'll get into the questionable ethics of China and killing um, their own citizens. In oh, a, yeah, in I know. A, I, a... I, I knew I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but that's okay, because that's, that's a different podcast. That's, that's a different, different podcast. That's a different podcast. That's a different podcast. But it, just, it, it, it shows a pattern. Okay. But I, I won't get into that. Okay, so let's go back to the recent report that... Um, produced by the FBI and the Department of Energy. Yeah. When I know those are been... not health authorities for one thing. No, but they're not health authorities, but they're the they're the organizations that look into the wrongdoings of others. Oh, okay. So And I know uh, before you yeah. jump in yeah. and I, I because I, you're probably going to say something about that they didn't actually conclude that it was a, a laboratory leak. Correct. But, correct. But they said there was strong evidence. No, they, they did, did not actually. The did quote, you read the article? I did, and it is low confidence. Low confidence. And so to me, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. that means something very particular. What low does... confidence mm -hmm. that it actually happened and so you know they actually also cite that they they lack direct scientific evidence so they they think it happened mm -hmm. they have no evidence to prove it and they have low confidence in it they they have the evidence they don't they can't share it 
because of national security. Okay, so that's funny that you think they have the evidence and they can't share it because of national security. Like mm -hmm. you have an inside view into that. Do well, you? That, no, no, because that's why the government voted unanimously to release the so-called um, documents related to the origins. So we might still get a revised version of of this from the FBI once these documents have been released, but who knows when that's actually even going to happen. And with with uh, President Biden being compromised by the Chinese, it may never happen. And same with Justin Trudeau. And so the Biden administration has actually said that there's no definitive answer on the source of the pandemic. You know that, right? Yeah, because Biden and family and uh, administration is compromised by the Chinese government. No, because the CDC, the WHO, and the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, mm -hmm. hear that last part? Infectious diseases, they have all cited a very strong scientifically based origin. Mm -hmm. And then the FBI and Department of U.S. Energy have said something different, even though they have low confidence in what they themselves have said. So what they're showing right now is it's kind of equivocal, and that's why they want these documents released. Right, but the head of the CDC back at the beginning of the pandemic, he wasn't even involved with okay, the, but back at the, the high level of the meetings. But back at the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody knew what the heck was going on? No, but Nobody. there were there were rumors, and I remember rumors you and I. No, 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 no. Matter. Wait, wait, I wait, wait. Scientific. You got to let me speak about the science, dude. But go ahead. What I was going to say is, when the pandemic first started, and I was hearing rumors of um, a laboratory breach, and we talked about this three years ago. It doesn't matter. No, I know, but the head of the CDC. Redfield, Robert Redfield, has the same concerns, but he was silenced by Fauci it, and other... It doesn't other... matter. You know why? why? You know why he was silenced? Because they don't want to instill fear in people in a time when people are already terrified for their lives. So to be spouting stuff like that, and, you know, turns out it wasn't fact anyway. They did a good job by silencing him from saying that because that just would have driven people even more crazy than everybody already was. But three years on now, we can honor the actual science behind it and acknowledge where it actually came from, which was not a lab breach. I still disagree. There, there's still... Okay. An, there's an, no, wait, there's ample evidence that... They were weaponizing, <laughs> that they okay. were weaponizing it, and they, a breach, okay, air well, quotes. Air quotes, yeah, because I have actual scientific evidence. Well, the scientific evidence that you have, that you've presented. No, has... I haven't presented it yet, because you haven't let me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, talk. But what were you going to say about my science? No, go ahead. No, what no, were you going to no, say? No, no, go, 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 go. What were you going to say? All I was going to say was that any science that um, that was done in a lab or change um, or in uh, that occurred in nature, from jumping from human to or from animal to human, um, there's science to show that that happens. But but the big but here is that it's yours <laughs> that there's ample evidence that it, it it could have come from a lab that was researching and mutating coronaviruses to weaponize it to take out or no to like to, to weaponize um, the, a COVID virus, and the two thousand two two thousand three outbreak was just a, a run up and a test run for phase two, which was the twenty twenty COVID nineteen pandemic. They wanted to see how 
the governments of the world would react. And when they were talking about a lab leak in Taiwan and uh, Singapore, and also from a smaller lab leak from the Wuhan Institute, it was just it, it was a, a test run. They they do this. Okay, so you have no evidence for any of that, but I just <laughs> presented it for the last fifty two no, minutes. No, all you all you presented was like. Oh, well, some people have been funding a lab and there was some research being done there. And so it means that it came from there. That's all. That's all. That's all. Okay. But, but here, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. So I read a a paper and I'm not one of those people who just like, oh, I read one paper. So I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, I have read several papers in scientific journals Mm -hmm. Um, that I have access to because I am a doctoral student. Mm -hmm. So I can get these through the university library. So this is good hard science. But one in particular that I do want to cite is called The Molecular Epidemiology of Multiple Zoonotic Origins of Mm SARS-CoV-2. Okay. And this paper kicks your butt. (laughs) Okay. Let me tell you Mm -hmm. the actual science that this was a spillover from animals. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of studies that came out a couple of years ago. Well, actually, no, last year, pardon me. It's 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, Two papers that came out in 2022 that show pretty much definitively that it came from the Hunan seafood wholesale market. Okay. Okay. Um, So, in the Hunan seafood wholesale market, they sell live wildlife mm-hmm. for fur and meat. Mm-hmm. Some of these are uh, red foxes, badgers, hares, marmots, um, those uh, civets. Um, they even sell hedgehogs, <laughs> which is just like really disturbing. Um, disgustingly enough, um, there are live animal... <laughs> skinning machines on site nice i know i like i just i cry thinking about these poor little animals but anyway um one of these animals that they have there is the raccoon dog which Mm -hmm. despite its name is neither a raccoon nor a dog but is a very very cute little guy Mm -hmm. and looks a lot like a dog with the face of a raccoon and it is in the canine family it's in it's in that family Right. But they also have bats. Mm-hmm. Okay. So follow me with what I'm, what I'm doing here. Okay. So um, these bats, as you spoke about earlier. Mm-hmm. The horseshoe bats? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's actually several caves near the Hunan Seafood Wholesale Market. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they do sell bats at the, at the market as well. Now, these raccoon dogs, they're supposed to hibernate over the, the winter. They're one of the, the few canine um, mm-hmm. species, if okay. not the only one, I can't remember, um, who is supposed to hibernate over the winter, but instead they're farmed and sold for their fur. And like I said, they are live skinned. Um, mm-hmm. And so, unfortunately, I've actually seen photos of the live skinning machine not in action but thank God. Um, but it's a nightmare. It's it's a real nightmare. And I've seen these little raccoon dogs in cages at the Hunan market. Okay. There's a large area near the Hunan market where they farm these raccoon dogs. And it's also near the area with the caves with the bats. Okay. So this has all been... This is... And see, this is why you can't trust studies that come out like in the first year of something completely completely novel like this and mm-hmm. like SARS in 03 because these kind of investigations especially good science good science takes time right or I don't disagree with that yeah so what they've found is that it seems very very likely that there's a lineage A and a lineage B okay okay these are two separate incidents how 
the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 mm-hmm. spread to two different people at the Hunan market. Okay. Who then spread it outside the market. And so lineage A, mm-hmm. they're thinking was the bats. Okay. <clears throat> the bats themselves. And they've actually traced, because they shut down the Hunan market so quickly when this was coming to light, they actually found evidence of this lineage A. They actually found actual genetic evidence of this lineage A of the SARS-CoV-2 on gloves at the market from this guy that was handling bats. Okay. And they've actually found evidence, actual science here. Okay. Okay. (laughs) They've, they've found genetic material on the cages and carts and other things that were handling the raccoon dogs. And it dates back the best estimate that they can get Mm -hmm. through all this genetics is November 18th, 2019. So um, there's evidence of trading these animals and the animals being present at the Wuhan market. Mm Mm-hmm sustained contact between these animals and humans at the market that laid the foundation for this zoonotic spillover. And um, the market stalls were absolutely correlated with the environmental samples. The metal cages, the carts, the actual epidemiological evidence of the two different lineages taken environmental samples from the market. And, you know, it's funny, this poor little raccoon dog, there's, there's a Japanese species, which is actually, you know, when we're playing Super Mario and Mario puts on like that little raccoon looking outfit. Right. And they call it Tanuki Mario. Mm -hmm. That's a raccoon dog, actually, Ah, which I just learned. Yeah. But the other species has four subtypes, subtypes. And it was one of these that was involved in the transmission. So they had been farming these poor little raccoon dogs near the cave. So it looks like bat from cave probably Mm -hmm. infected the raccoon dogs and then both the raccoon dogs and the bats were being sold at the hunan market there's your spillover there is the origin of covid19 boom (laughs) okay except the timing doesn't match up that's all it does because if you (sighs) and i don't mean this to sound at all patronizing or pedantic or anything Mm -hmm. but if you were to try to read the article that i cited earlier in this podcast the molecular epidemiology Mm -hmm. um you would see that they they were able to sequence the genomes they were able to pull it back look at the lineages go through all the different rare mutations like this is a hardcore science expose and the haplotypes they, they looked for what they call ancestral haplotypes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know when you talked about that, that percentage that was similar? Right. This is a very definitive result that this haplotype was unique. So, you know, just as you and I are unique from chimpanzees, mm-hmm. no one else has my DNA right? Right. No one else has yours. Mm -hmm. Same thing that goes with SARS-CoV-2. So although it may have shared other stuff Mm -hmm. from the past, it was very unique to 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 November November? of 2019. Hmm. Science. She blinded me with science. Bow, bow, bow. Okay, but you're you're still missing a huge bit here. No, I'm not. Just because I I don't disagree with. The, the, <laughs> I wish you could see me now, folks. I'm dancing. <laughs> I don't disagree with with 
the way that um, these scientific articles and research has been conducted, yeah. and they're good. They're Cause... tracing, they're contact tracing, and um, the lineage and everything back to to a specific point. But that still doesn't. There's still the possibility that even with the evidence that they found on the cages and the gloves and from the market. It, You're saying it was planted? Yes. Okay. It could so, have been. I, I mean, I I cannot say it wasn't. Okay? I can't. Right. And I wasn't there. Yeah. And neither were you. No, e exactly. But I, I think it's likely that... The evidence could have been that this is all uh, all a setup um, for a more nefarious purposes. And I guess that is your conspiracy-minded right mm -hmm. to believe that this was nefarious, and it is my scientifically-minded right to um, believe the science and the epidemiology and all of the studies that can show, you know, these bats are here with the virus, these dogs are here with mm -hmm. the virus, this market was here with the virus, and none of it had been outside of those areas prior to that date. I, I guess where I ha where I'm stuck with the I guess where I'm stuck is that this all happened in close proximity to this lab that has a history of questionable funding, questionable research. Yeah, but questionable funding doesn't mean that th that it, you know, like I know, but we, that's, uh, that's a fallacy to, to link those things, you know? A plus B does not equal C. That's a fallacy. Well, that might be true. <laughs> you got to look at at the motives the 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 key players and what their what the long term gain would be i i recognize the conspiratorial thought process behind what you're saying and, and I, I can see how you would think that way and i don't doubt the science that you're you're providing um i'm i'm like I said, I get hung up on the, the the coincidence of the laboratory and the location of this outbreak. Right. <clears throat> well, I guess, I don't know, we're going to have to agree to disagree on that part of it until the other um, papers are released. We'll see what more may come from the U.S. government. Um, but, I mean, certainly... I would invite anybody to go look for these articles from um, 2002 that talk about the, the science and trace it back. Right. And I, I just want to say one other thing, like the outcome. So what? It, who cares if it was um, – or let me start over. Just the, the outcome, I want to just talk about that for two seconds because look what's happened since 2020 or 2019. We've had massive – supply chain disruptions most well, i shouldn't say most but a large portion of uh, products that we use in our everyday life come from china look at all the supply chain issues that we're having um, the cost of everything is skyrocketing could this not be part of a larger plan well you know again i don't have evidence to that neither do you um i, I just motives of, yeah. questions you know that's that's fine but that's why we are science versus conspiracy <laughs> <laughs> you know i i i know that viruses come from nature all the time like look at us with ebola right look at I, I, okay, actually, I shouldn't have said anything because you're going <laughs> to, I know you got something for all of it. I'm not going to go there. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun debate 
um, it's been it's been fun to read into the history of these. Mm-hmm. You know, my nerdy brain loved reading these articles for sure. And I'm sure your conspiracy brain loved reading, um, you know, the theories. Um, yeah, I went down many rabbit holes. I bet. I bet. I bet. This, I- is, this has been a fun one for sure. You know, and I think it's it's interesting because it's as much as we can say it's it's no matter what we debate the impact it's had on the world is not debatable <laughs> right like this right. this has changed life so drastically for all of us um and i know you think that there is really ulterior motives behind it all um absolutely 100 percent. well you know remains to be seen Well, we should get into, not now, but in a future episode, we should talk about the outcome. Like we talked about some of the, in, in some of this in a, a previous episode about the inflation and the fa- some of the fallout, but we, we should really dive into it a little bit deeper, I think. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because folks, if you have enjoyed this debate and discussion about the COVID-19 pandemic, you should really watch for our new podcast coming out. You know, yes, the conspiracy side of things here, Bob is going to talk more about China and... um, Their influence over government... And and their influence over certain governments around the world. Yeah, so, you know, that's that's definitely going to be coming out. But if you've enjoyed this, you should really look for our our new podcast that's going to be coming out this spring. We have called it Hindsight is 2020, and we're going to be dissecting and discussing 2020, the most life-altering and bizarre year in recent history, (laughs) and all with special guests, too. We're going to be really looking at all the weirdness of 2020. There's a lot of weirdness. Yeah, and we'll be starting right from the beginning of the year with the Australian bushfires. So I guess we'll leave it for there today. Just so you know, folks, um, you know, we might get a little a little heated in our debating, but we respect each other. And that's what we want for you folks, too. So please talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your family, but be respectful. Mm-hmm. Keep an open mind as we both do. You know, he says, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the science part of it. And I say, yeah, you know. I can't say that it wasn't a great conspiracy. I can't because I don't have any proof otherwise. But just be respectful of each other. So with that, I'm going to say this is science signing off and stay curious, but rely on the facts. And I'm conspiracy. And remember, being paranoid is smart. We'll see you next time. This episode of Science vs. Conspiracy Over Coffee was produced by Story Monkey. Writing and research was done by Bob Homer and Jennifer Timer. <laughs>